Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest is an entrepreneur at heart. Started in 2014, he co-founded Pips and Bounds, Portland's best ping pong bar restaurant. Due to COVID in 2020, he made a pivot and started a coffee roasting company. Please welcome the founder of Scout Coffee Roasters, Eugene Jung. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Eugene Jung from Scout Coffee, Portland, Oregon. Eugene, how are we doing? Uh, living here in Portland, Oregon. Um, and uh, this is my second go at bootstrapping entrepreneurship at its rawest form. Um, but well before that, um, you know, I, I like to I, I'd like to share the story of telling people because, you know, my background is is Korean American. Uh, I grew up in Appalachia, uh, Eastern Kentucky, Texas, where we were the, you know, one and only Asian family and probably a three hour radius because I can say that because the closest Asian grocery store was Columbus, Ohio, which was three hours away. Uh, so we always had that family trip once a month in the big suburban picking up a month worth of, uh, uh Asian food supplies. Um, did my whole, like, you know, grade school, middle school, high school there. And then, uh, when I decided to make the, uh, make the jump to college, um, that's when I think things kind of did a turn of events for me, uh, meaning going from small town, comfortable, um, pace of life. And then I went to school of university of Michigan, Ann Arbor, um, where, you know, my, I like to say my chemistry 101 class, the lecture room was bigger than my whole entire high school. So that was a, a huge learning curve. I would say that was probably my first adult learning curve of um, how to adjust to your surroundings and the competition and the people around you um, from Eastern Kentucky to, I mean, it's it's bitterly cold and bitterly hot and humid <laughs> up in Michigan <laughs> to a, you know, a wonderful, fabulous uh, four-year university in uh, University of Michigan, which I had a great time, but I can definitely say that was my first um, eye-opening experience of what, um, you know, being adult is kind of being light. And then from there, I actually graduated in 2002, and <clears throat> that was one year after 9-11. So the job market, if you want to talk about employment, was... Uh, pretty bleak at that time. So I took another uh, curve in life and I actually did uh, what not many students do. I took a, a gap year. Um, I actually went traveled into uh, New Zealand, Australia, Southeast Asia one year because I just could not find a job uh, at that moment. So I was like, screw it. I'm going to go travel, uh, do my own thing, backpack. Um, and that was super cool, super fun. Probably one of the best decisions I've ever done that was not career related. And then um, my uh, tourist visa expired and I'm like, all right, back to reality. Uh, what am I going to do now? So I came back and I actually, uh, you know, did a whole job search thing, which we all know how it's done and how it's, you know, like beating a, uh, beating a bush basically. And I actually landed a gig and, um, Apple computers, where I was probably one of the first Apple retail store employees uh, as they were launching their retail division. Yeah. Uh, so that was actually a really cool experience. Um, this could be interesting to hear for other people, but that was the pre iPod, pre iPhone. This was when we actually had to try to sell computers. <laughs> where 
you know, they don't even, they, they sell themselves like hotcakes now. But back then it was like, this is the reason why you need an Apple computer. Um, and it took a lot of time and effort and convincing to tell people it's like the Apple computer is what for them. So, you know, I did that for a few years. I opened up the first few stores ever uh, for Apple retail. Um, I helped open the Apple Soho store, the Apple Manhattan Fifth Avenue store, and did a small stunt in, I think it was called the um, Meatpacking District store. Um, so I've done a couple openings, worked in a crazy high volume retail environment. Um, and I would say that's probably my first experience in terms of selling, how to connect with people. The training that I had to do with Apple uh, back in that day was actually very extensive because it was really important for them how to position uh, the employees and aligning it with the store and aligning it with the public because it was their launch, so to say. Um, so we actually probably had two, maybe two and a half weeks of really, really extensive training, um, which I still take heart today, um, you know, many, many years later. And um, that was probably my one-on-one -on -one in terms of my career and how I pursue everything today. But I got kind of tired of um, working in retail. Retail is, is a grind. Um, and as we all know, New York City is a huge city for opportunity. And one thing led to another, and I actually worked, uh, I found a job doing um, legal business development and marketing. And what that means is working in a law firm. So not many people really know, I would say, but there is a division or department in large law firms we're probably talking about you know higher than 200 lawyers up to maybe 2,000 lawyers and they have a whole department of business development market just dedicated and focused on supporting the attorneys helping develop their practice doing all the marketing for them getting the word out getting their activities out and I did that for about 10 years in New York City after my stint in Apple retail um, <clears throat> and that was corporate that was corporate through and through um, you know, how, what's the best way to professional services? You know, that was, I remember the first day of walking in, I'm like, all right, here I am in a suit and tie on job day number one. And I was still like that for 10 years later, um, I was still suit and tie. And then, um, you know, kind of giving all this in a nutshell. And I was like, I was tired of the rat race in New York, 10 years doing legal business development, marketing and working in New York City. And, you know, snap a finger, 10 years has gone by. And then I realized if I don't do anything or uh, actively kind of pursue other interests, another snap in the finger, another 10 years will go by in New York City. So I, that was a great timing where I took a turn where I was doing my first stand of entrepreneurship. So what that means is I had an opportunity with my brother to co-found a business that we call Pips and Bounce, which is uh, Portland's, I like to say, best ping pong bar <laughs> restaurant. Uh, you know, it's a brand new concept. It was 10 years ago. Uh, I would say maybe a handful, maybe less than 10 businesses were like that in the whole country at that moment. So it was brand new territory. Uh, and we all know bowling. We all know billiards. Um, we all know putt-putt. But there's really nothing like that in terms of ping pong. And, you know, for us, for my brother and I, we really connected because as a family growing up in Eastern Kentucky, uh, we had a ping pong table in our basement and that was our thing. Like we would play that every day before dinner until my mom would scream on the top of her lungs saying dinner was ready and we would play that last point. Um, and we were asking ourselves, you know, why isn't that uh, available for adults? and a really fun environment with good music, good drinks, and good food. Um, and we put that test to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, the grounds. So we did pop-up parties in Portland, Oregon, where my brother was living. Um, so I would fly from New York to Portland, I would say maybe two or three times a month for about two years, doing pop-up parties all over the city. Um, it got to the point where we were doing, you know, this was the beginning of, pages 
for Facebook where people can actually develop business pages uh, as opposed to personal pages. So we kind of jumped on that bandwagon really early and developed a, one of the first, you know, business social pages in Portland, Oregon, and really did guerrilla marketing from there, uh, doing a lot of videos, pictures, last minute announcements, um, and got to the point where we were hosting parties, you know, the first party were probably like maybe 20, 25 people, and we were like, okay, like what do we get ourselves into? And then before we know it, you know, a couple years later, we were hosting parties for Adidas, Nike, Intel. Uh, whenever we hosted our own party, we would have hundreds of people, you know, throughout, you know, the day and night. And they got to, to the point where we were like, okay, like, this is not a um, business that can grow if we continue doing pop-ups. So we either, like, we stop doing pop-up parties or we go full-time. And that was kind of a leap of faith there where, you know, if anybody who's who started a bar restaurant, um, there's a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of um, cursing to start a new business. And there's something that, you know, my brother has never done anything like that and neither have I. And suddenly, you know, after all like the investments, the construction and everything, and here we are day one, you know, we are owners of a bar restaurant uh, where we've always become you know, customers. And I don't think I knew anybody at that time who worked or owned in a bar and restaurant. So we had to learn real fast. Um, and then, you know, I can talk the details later about that whole experience, but fast forward to 2020, COVID happened. And then uh, the whole pips and bounce activity, which we had some really good momentum, uh, suddenly just dead stop because of COVID. And, you know, I had this 400 and 450 square foot space that I suddenly couldn't do anything with at a commercial kitchen that, you know, was basically sitting there empty gathering dust. And then I was unemployed because I had to shut down my own business for COVID. And then somebody told me, I think it was a staff member told me that Amazon fulfillment was hiring. And I was like, Okay, like I didn't never imagine myself doing that, but I just couldn't stay home and do nothing um, because I was just so busy running my own business. And that's just how that was just my that was my pace of life at that moment. So I actually applied for the gig at Amazon Fulfillment and I was a my job was being a picker. And what a picker does is basically pick items on people's orders that they've done on the phone or on the computer. So you kind of see a real life a uh, snippet of what people were ordering at the beginning of COVID. Not that I could compare with any other day from Amazon, um, <clears throat> but I probably worked there for six weeks. Uh, it was grueling because, you know, they, everything is uh, on metrics. So they want to measure how many items do you pick in a minute and what's your accuracy rate and everything. Um, and you know it's like eight to ten hour shifts you're picking like three thousand items a day and then you go home you do it again the next day so it was grueling but over time i kind of actually caught on to something where i was soon discovering i was picking most popular two categories that were most popular people ordering at that moment um, and those two categories were pet food and coffee and i was kind of like okay well you know I can kind of see that, you know, ping pong is a non-essential activity or business. So that kind of made me think about, you know, the future of what I want to do. And then when I looked at, uh, when I worked at Amazon, I was like, all right, pet food and coffee. If this is what people are ordering at the beginning of the biggest crisis that I've experienced in my life, there's something to say about that. So I quickly did some research of what to do and how to start a pet food company and Within three minutes, I quickly lost interest. Not that I don't love pets. I actually love pets, <laughs> but I just have nothing to do with pet food. Um, and then I, you know, shifted gears into roasting coffee. And that was super interesting. And I had the space uh, of a commercial kitchen that was being unused. So I actually just repurposed that kitchen uh, as a small little hobby roasting space for myself. Um, so I quit Amazon just because I got, kind of got tired of that gig and that was just something to fulfill my mind because I just had a lot of empty time. 
And then, I, you know, it did the whole story when I did the roasting. I bought a one pound roaster. Uh, I think I actually bought off Amazon, um, which is funny to say. And then just started to learn how to roast coffee from internet, YouTube, university, um, making a ton of crap coffee. Uh, that I just drank for myself, and after one sip, I'm like, this is the most horrible coffee I've ever tried. But, you know, it's one of those things where it's a skill and a trade that you don't learn overnight. You kind of have to give it a lot of time, kind of get a lot of information, um, and it's a lot of trial and error to the point where, you know, I'm kind of jumping around here, but like, as of today, three years later, um, I have my own dedicated full-time roasting facility um, I have my own commercial roaster. I am roasting hundreds of pounds of beans a week. And most notably, uh, we won a national roasting competition, which is probably nice. the most competitive competition in the world. Um, and that's, uh, that is kind of the arc of my career, corporate entrepreneurship one, entrepreneurship two kind of um, journey. So it's been wild. It's been unpredictable at best, uh, but I've been thoroughly enjoying it. So at what point did you kind of make the decision that, you know what, I don't, I'm done with the corporate world. I'm going to do entrepreneurship. Yeah. Uh, so the, the answer is really easy. Um, every organization is set up differently. Um, the law firm organization essentially how I viewed it and what was my experience was every partner of the firm was my boss. And this firm I was working for probably had close to 400 partners. So in essence, I had 400 bosses. And what my role was at the company is I did a lot of proposals, um, that, which means I had to work with a lot of different um, practice groups, which means I had to work with a lot of different partners. And then, you know, doing 10 years of that and I think towards the end of that 10 years, I was just like, I am just tired of having that many bosses all the time um, telling me what to do and kind of expect me to know what they know. And I'm not a practicing attorney and these guys were Manhattan partners. And I just kind of like, I just, I was like, this, I, like, I don't know why I didn't think about this sooner, but like, this is not for me. Um, and I just kind of knew that I have something to offer. I don't know exactly what that was, but, um, you know, I had a couple of people work beneath me in my department and I just kind of enjoyed not working necessarily with them, but just helping them develop and helping them think how to approach this challenge and how to approach that challenge. Um, so I think that kind of made some leadership skills, so to say. And then, you know, I just got like the, the 10 years of working law firm, 10 years living in the city, I was like, I just need to make a change. Um, and a big catalyst that was like, I just can't work in an environment that has somebody above me. <laughs> I wanted to be my own boss. <laughs> Now, what would you say has been, um, you know, kind of going, thinking about your beginning of your entrepreneurial journey, what, what, what have you found enjoyable about the process? Mm. Um, entrepreneurship for me is, <clears throat> I think the best way to answer that is, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie. I have considered and I've actually pursued, um, you know, job opportunities throughout my entrepreneurship journey, which has been close to like 12 years now. Um, there's been times where business has been bad and I'm like, okay, like I need to find a job. I need to find a way to support myself. Um, you know, being an entrepreneur does not mean it's rosy, uh, not to the least bit. Um, but then when I was kind of talking to like recruiters and everything, they saw my resume and my LinkedIn profile, then it was interesting when they, in their perspective, because their perspective was like, you need to show people that you're excellent at one thing if you want to work 
in corporate or back into you know an office job setting like is like your job screams entrepreneurship which means you wear a lot of hats and i'm like oh like i didn't even think like that and i think when now that looking back at it is like i kind of don't want to do one thing granted if you go to a job of course you get promoted you get different responsibilities and you learn different things like but i was like i don't want to be a specialist on one thing i really enjoy the challenge of being an entrepreneur meaning you know having a really good product trying to figure out how to sell this product to the masses and and in my case you know people who drink coffee which there is a lot of people and you know it is an industry that's not new it's been around forever um but at the same time i mean there's always room for more coffee <laughs> in this world and more coffee roasters and you know my enjoyment of it is really you know scout coffee roasters did not exist three years ago um and here i am you know winning competitions um people are buying and ordering every day uh for me and it's really kind of seen a growth of a company and being part of that and leading that as opposed to just being a cog in the wheel. I think that's where I enjoy the most being entrepreneurship, where I can actually see the results almost every day. And then seeing it again year over year is like, oh my God, this is where we were last year compared to now. Like, this is fantastic, but it doesn't stop me. Like, I'm never really satisfied. So, you know, entrepreneurship has some of its enjoyable moments, but it also has some of its challenges as well. In fact, one of the challenges you highlighted was the pandemic, right, during the, the pip and bounce. Outside of that, what are some other uh, difficulties or challenges that you encountered throughout your entrepreneurial endeavor? Um, <clears throat> I would say number one is, you know, I don't get a paycheck every two weeks. Um, I pay myself when I can, how I can, and I find ways to um, discover different opportunities that I could pay myself. It could be like another side hustle that could be related in the coffee industry or whatnot. Um, but the if one is comfortable getting that paycheck every two weeks and you know I, I admit I was that person too and then suddenly you know huh, I'm, I'm gonna actually pivot a little bit somebody told me an entrepreneurship is like working 110 percent and getting rewarded 25 percent <laughs> fair <laughs> fair you know it's you know I there, there is no guarantee that you know um you get paid consistently in the same over time. And that's been a huge challenge. Um, and especially in a new business. Um, that's number one. And I think it's very important because everyone needs to know if they're gonna go down this path to so be prepared that, you know, you may not get paid one month, two months, six months, whoever knows, depending on how this how the business grows. So I would say number one, especially if you bootstrap it from the ground up, like I did. Uh, number two, in terms of challenges of entrepreneurship, is you know it's a uh, it's more of a no world than a yes world, and what I mean by that is every time I pursue a sale or an account or um, opportunities of growth um it kind of falls in three categories yes nor or you just never hear from them maybe and the yeses um are much less than the maybes and nos so it's kind of like developing a thick skin and always trying to find a better way to communicate and angle and better your your your, your trade as a, as a as a partner or as a sales or as marketing and celebrate those yeses as much as you can because they're well-earned and, and fought for. Um, 
you know, I would say in the very beginning, when I, at least in the coffee business, you know, I've got more no's than ever before just because coffee is extremely competitive. And I just really had to figure out what my voice is and what my brand is uh, until now where actually I had a call this morning with a major grocery store in Southern California, um, I think with like close to 30 stores or something. And when I was doing my pitch to them, um, they were like, you did all this in three years? And I'm like, yeah, they're like, you're talking, you're communicating. I hear, and they hear pitches all the time. He's like, I hear pitches of people have done this not even in 20 and 25 years. And, um, you know, it, those are the small things that I kind of celebrate that I never pat myself in the back for. But um, now knowing what I do now three years later, like, the yeses are coming a little bit more often, which is which is great. That means I'm just getting better at what I do. You know, one of the things you mentioned was you found your voice, your brand identity. How did you go about finding, how did you go about creating the skunk, uh, the Scout Coffee brand to the point where you're getting so many yeses? Yeah, so with any brand and identity, uh, you need to have a, like a little story. It's like a storytelling. Um, books, uh, small books, so to say. And <clears throat> when I did my research and how to do this, because uh, luckily coffee is one of those things where you just go to a grocery store and you just immediately find your competition. So I went to the grocery store and, uh, you know, I looked at the shelves and found out all the coffee, both local and um, nationwide. And uh, for me, my personal interest um, outside of work is travel. Like I'd love to travel. Um, and the places that I travel are kind of a little bit off the beaten path. Like I do a lot of motorcycling and when I motorcycle, I kind of go to places where it's a bit remote, but beautiful, uh, hard to get to purposely. Um, so it's a bit secluded and a little isolated, but I find myself that's where I enjoy traveling the most. <clears throat> So when I saw kind of all the bags and how people need their bags, they were a bit abstract or a bit too like, you know, this coffee brand just has a an item like a ship or a boat or something like that. And I was like, I wanted to share a place where, you know, it's something that's interesting that I've been to that I can tell a little story on the back of my coffee bag. So all my coffee names are actually places that I've been to. Uh, so, for example, like Hell's Canyon, Cabot Trail, Tale of the Dragon, Schaefer Canyon. These places are actually mostly, there's, I have two international locations and everything else is in America. Uh, but they're not most popular. They're not like the Grand Canyon or Yellowstone. Um, and these places have been probably the most memorable places for me because I traveled with them for whatever reason that left a really good impression. And then the back of the bag, I pretty much kind of tell, you know, three or four sentences about this place. And then I match it with the profile of the coffee, of the sensory experience that I have with the coffee that matches with the, uh, with the destination. And when I tell people that, um, they were kind of like, they love it. Like they just want to grab a bag and be like, wow, like Schaefer Candy, like I even know what it is. Oh, it's in Southern Utah. So then... You know, if I give them the action to go to Google Maps or search what Schaefer Canyon is, that's my short, that's my story that I love sharing. And if people actually act up on that, that's a success for me. What's one thing or what's something you wish you would have known before you started your entrepreneurial endeavor that you know now? Uh, where do I start? I would say you don't have to do this, but it uh, helps a lot and relieves a lot of stress. Having capital, for sure. Um, to relate to that pips and bounce, I invested a lot of my savings that I made when I was living and working in New York. Um, Truth be told, I haven't recouped those savings from Pips of Bounce, and that's been almost 10 years. Um, and there's been 
couple of months where I did not pay myself. Payroll, we didn't meet payroll. Um, applying that capital to uh, the coffee business, uh, you know, it is a pretty capital intensive business from the get go. You kind of have to have, you know, a commercial roaster. Uh, they're more expensive than luxury SUV cars on the road. I mean, they're, they could be up to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how big you get. And not only that, but you have to buy inventory and inventory is, you know, thousands of dollars, um, just sitting on the shelves until you need to, you know, start roasting it. So it's a lot of upfront costs before you even make that first sale. Um, Scout Coffee, I bootstrapped it and it was painful growth going from one pound roaster to uh, an 11 pound roaster that's you know commercially rated now so I can do for consistency. Um, that took uh, a punch in the chin to you know pay for that essentially. And then, you know, finding everything else that makes it work in terms of operating a coffee roaster. So capital for sure. Um, number two, I would say, what do I know now? Or what do I know that I wish I knew back then? Um, I would say, you know, just there's, there's never, it's, it's not an equation. Business is not an equation. Um, a plus B does not equal C in the world of business. Um, you know, when you think of coffee, you can very think of it simply as you get a bean, you roast it, and then you drink it. Um, but, you know, I have different, I found ways where like, okay, like grocery store, yeah, a lot of people buy coffee at grocery store, but there's other ways that are actually, you know, very lucrative, like the whole gift market. Like I didn't know gifting products and the gift market was so huge just because I've always just been a consumer but like people love gifting especially in the holiday season I'm like holy cow like you know I should have known that from the Apple days where like you know buying computers at that time is like you know it's again like hotcakes and also gifting and coffee so easy to gift and I never thought of that I never thought of coffee being a gifting product um and that was one thing I was like, I need to jump on this at this time of the year because, you know, it's sales. Um, and then, you know, I actually never thought coffee in terms of volume. Um, I've always been kind of a single cup drinker, maybe a couple of times a day. Uh, but now being on the other side, you know, I, my clients are multi-unit, multi-office, co-working spaces, um, you know, in Oregon and in California and also in Washington. And, you know, my thought is like, okay, so this business has, you know, up to 200 people. Like I need to find a way to get my coffee in front of 200 people and find, you know, give them the all in one solution of my coffee with their equipment and my knowledge and everything. Um, so, you know, it goes well beyond of what I think what coffee is. Um, and that, I didn't know until I actually got into the business, you know? So I would say, you know, definitely a business is not an equation. There's always different ways to uh, explore. Where, uh, as we begin to explore, where is Scout Coffee in five, 10 years? So my, so I've been in business for three years. Um, so if I've been in business for five, 10 years later, I have a goal and, you know, these are all kind of silly goals, but I think that are still relevant is I have really two good friends who moved to Arizona and I haven't even told them. So, you know, if they listen to this podcast, they would be like, oh my God, that's us. <laughs> um, you know, I want my coffee to, I don't even want to tell them. I want my coffee to be at their gross, their local grocery store shelf. I want them to come into the aisle and think tucson arizona or somewhere around there be like oh my god this is eugene's coffee like how did it get from all the way from oregon to arizona and that's kind of my secret five-year goal maybe i can actually achieve that a little bit sooner um but you know that's uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of stupid when i think about it but i think it's also just really relevant that geographical footprint is 
expanded well beyond just the local state area. Um, I know it takes a lot of work and a lot of luck and timing, uh, but people do it. It's been done before. It's not rocket science. Um, and I would love to have my friends just shoot me that text message uh, or a photo like your your coffee your coffees in our in our local grocery store. So I would love to like give those little surprises that people who I know on a personal level, and then they see my product that you know we roast here, no matter where they are in America. Um, that's my general five, ten year goal. Um, if I can achieve that, because I know people all over the states, um, then I think I'm doing a pretty, pretty decent job. I like it. So, so ten years, right? You've been doing pips and bounce. Got the last two years or so, you've been doing scout. What advice do you have for aspiring entrepreneurs? I would say number one. Um, Get ready for a, a, a wild and crazy ride. Um, I, 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 I really love it. I thrive it. Um, I like waking up every morning and knowing that there's still a huge challenge in front of me every day. Um, I know that over time, those challenges will be you know met and achieved. But it's the buildup of every day to you know get to that point. Um, I did not feel that when I was not working on my own business. Um, you know, I would wake up and it'd be just one of those slog days. You go to work and then you clock out of work and you just don't think about it. Uh, for me, and this is a good and bad thing. Like it's almost all encompassing. Even when I'm on vacation, and I was in Europe. On vacation and I'm like all right I want to find a local coffee roaster and just try their beans on a different place uh, you know on, on earth and you know it's almost all-encompassing and I'm sure it bothers the people around me I hope it doesn't too much uh, but it's really something that I enjoy you know and actually one piece of advice I tell actually uh, other people is <clears throat> If you have an idea uh, as an entrepreneur, if you have an idea, I always say that think about it for at least a couple of weeks at a minimum. And if that idea is still front and center in your mind after that course of time, then you have something. Now, if that idea just completely disappears and you don't even think about it, it's not in your head anymore, then it's good you did not pursue that because then if you did, you might just hate your life. That's a, that's a great point. Cause I think that's a, the difference between a, you know, a career and a job, right? Finding that passion, if it's something you do and you're passionate about. Now, what if the folks, folks that are interested to in learning more about Eugene, they want to find your coffee. How can they find you online? Where can they find the coffee in stores? Sure. So online, um, we have a full, you know, e-commerce page that people can order like anything else. Uh, the website is scoutcoffeeroasters.com and scout is actually spelled S-K-A-U-T. Uh, it's a little play off words. Um, and we have all our products there. Um, and I um, actively, also on social media, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook, not on X formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and in terms of grocery stores in the Portland area, you know, we're in like the market of choice, world market, um, hopefully going to be in like new seasons here pretty soon. We are in a bunch of retail stores for
is, you know, I'm trying to put together a, an all-in-one solution for not only for my coffee that, you know, is award-winning, but also pairing up with some really high-end premium coffee brewing machines, also known as like super automatic espresso machines, um, or as one of those fancy LCDs, one-touch display. Yeah, yeah, those are those are snazzy. Yeah, they're, they're great. Um, because, you know, one of the most common questions people ask me is like, you know, where's your coffee shop? And, you know, I'm not sure if, if people know, but there are plenty of coffee shops here in Portland, Oregon. Um, I personally don't think another coffee shop is needed in the city. <laughs> Probably not, yes. <laughs> um, so I, my kind of, um, at the moment I see it right now, my kind of pursue is, all right, you know, let me partner up with a coffee machine like what I'm talking about. And I might as well just say it. It's, it's Jura, spelled J-U-R-A. Uh, they're kind of a premium coffee brewing machine and really kind of aim slash offices, um, home, um, just because in the post-COVID world, I think more people make coffee home more now than ever. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that habit is probably more or less here to stay, I think. Um, and people can enjoy fantastic coffee at home um, and they don't really have to go out and really pay for their coffee and and do all that jazz pre-COVID, uh, so to say. So I think the, the change has happened and, you know, I really want to get coffee at people's homes and or offices. Um, <clears throat> so that is a new thing that I'm about to launch that I think is pretty exciting. Um, and it's, uh, I've used it many times over on, on a personal level and I'm like yeah like this completely makes sense I don't know why I need to go through drive through somewhere just to get coffee that is not that great um, so that's an interesting development and um, you know we're still working to better our trade and you know still compete in competitions uh, that's one thing that uh, we pride ourselves on so we're always trying to better our skill and trade and you know, I've learned, you know, crossing over from being um, a customer, a coffee, and now a roaster, there's there's just so much to learn. And I've only done this three years. And, you know, when I speak to my colleagues who've been doing this for, you know, 10, 20, 15 years, I'm like, oh, my God, like, the amount of knowledge that they have is just far exceeds what I know. And they're like, yeah, I've been doing this for 10, 15 years. But they're like, you've done this for three years. And um, you know, you're doing a pretty good bang up job, but I just feel like I still have so much to learn, which means, you know, it just betters the product, it betters the business. Um, so I like to think there is a lot of room for improvement uh, just beyond what's happening buying a bag of coffee at a store. Yep, that's very true. Again, folks, that is Scout coffeeroasters.com and if you forget any of this information this is a great time to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship podcast or the newsletter you can actually subscribe to the newsletter at theshadesofe.com we will have Eugene's information on there the week before the episode airs the week the episode airs and the week after we will also have an individual web page for Eugene and this episode with the transcription of our conversation on theshadesofe.com so again if you forgot everything we said you can actually go back and read it. Uh, Eugene, thank you again so much for being on the show. I really do appreciate it. So folks listening, I also am not on the X, but you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and TikTok. I have been some creating some reels, so please go check those out with a YouTube channel coming shortly. Eugene, is there anything else you'd like to say before we let the audience go today? Uh, Gabriel, I would say thanks for the opportunity uh, to talk. You know, uh, Entrepreneurs love to talk about themselves. Um, <laughs> So I hope I didn't uh, fulfill that stereotype <laughs> uh, beyond what people would be like, oh, my God, this guy needs to shut up. He did great. Um, but uh, super fun. I really appreciate it. And it's been a pleasure meeting you and being a, it's a pleasure being on your show and talking to you.
Yes, it is a pleasure. And so, folks, again, Scout Coffee, if you have not checked it out, please do. If you want some more information about Scout Coffee, I would highly, highly recommend going and check out the uh, TikTok reel that I created on the Shades of E on TikTok. So you can actually go ahead and see uh, Scout Coffee in action. Again, folks, uh, go ahead and follow at the Shades of E.com. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.